Can you see it? Yes, sir. We are seeing it, sir. Yeah. Uh, just for safety's sake, I'll disable the participants' annotations for uh, for the time being. Yes, sir. Okay. Sure, sir. Okay. And uh, just let me know when you want me to start off the presentation. Okay. Please. Okay. So end of the presentation, the question and answers would be uh, sent to through chat to you and you'll uh, ask me or how do you plan to go about it? Sir, we are asking all of them to ask the questions in the chat so that the moderator will present the questions to you yeah, and answer. Yeah. Sir. I suppose better. that's the better yes, option. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. sir will yes. take the question, sir, and he will uh, read out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Wonderful. I, I think Wonderful. As, as you said, you will take, take uh, in every 30 minutes, I hope. See, I can continue. Uh, I can go non-stop. Yes, it's my fa favorite topic, so I can always go non-stop. Okay. Okay, sir. I think uh, we'll start, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, I welcome all participants uh, to, for today's webinar on uh, HRCT temporal bone. Today, uh, this is a part one uh, where uh, Dr. Manoj Agarwal is going to speak on the normal anatomy. And in our second edition, he's going to speak on pathologies. And in third edition, he's going to speak on MRI of the temporal bone. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, one our moderator, Dr. Nilesh Mahajan from uh, Dr. Vijayendra Sir's auto group. I welcome him, sir. Thank you for accepting Thank my you, request. Arsha. Thank you, Arsha. Uh, sir, now I'll hand over the uh, screen to Nilesh, sir. He will introduce the speaker, and uh, from then I will begin. Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Mano Jagrawal sir is a very well known ENT and lateral scalpel surgeon in our field. So, there are a few awards on his name. All are almost gold medal I can see here. Dev Jani Banerjee Memorial Medal, then Ramesh Chandra Sen Memorial Medal, then RN Roy Choudhury Gold Medal and also sir has received major KK Ghosh Memorial Award. So, and sir has given uh, many presentation as the state, zonal, national and international levels. And apart from this, anyway, during his uh, lecture, we will come to know how boss he is in the, his field. So actually, sir's clinic name is also very interesting. If you can see there, that is the Malleus Clinic. So first time I have ever seen that somebody has labeled the clinic name as one of the most important ossicle for the hearing. So that is the Malleus. So that is very nice name, sir, actually. And apart from this, the, this is the academic and uh, ENT field. Sir is also very much interested in the films. So actually, sir has been the, one of the semi-finalists in Bollywood Ka Boss. If you have seen the program which was uh, headed by Mr. Bowman Irani. So sir is having some uh, extracurricular activities also. So I will like to call upon sir now and uh, to start with his presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome or rather good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever part of the world you may all be. Thank you, Dr. Mahajan, for those kind words. I'm not really very sure uh, whether I deserve them or not. It's just that uh, Dr. Sriharsh asked me for a profile and I was forced to send it. Usually I try avoid sending all those things. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sriharsh and Dr. Bhargav. Wonderful uh, initiative that you've taken to utilize this time. And uh, a, a small gentle shout out to those people who've lost someone in the last few weeks or months. And a bigger shout out to all those brave hearts who are fighting on behalf of all of us so that we all can have a better tomorrow. I'm sure things will turn for a uh, change for the better very soon. Anyway, let's not uh, waste any further time. We've got a very long way to traverse today. And let's jump straight into our presentation, which uh, is the normal anatomy as visualized on the CT scan of the temporal bone. Uh, just a bit of uh, legal matters to take care of. All these slides, all the pictures that you see here, rather the imaging uh, uh, images uh, as far as radiology images are concerned are 
entirely mine and I haven't taken them anywhere from the net or otherwise. And there's no conflict of interest from my side at least. And uh, how can uh, one start off a presentation without thanking one's teachers? I've always been, uh, God has been very grateful that he's given me some wonderful teachers, Dr. Utpal Jana from National Medical College, who was my guide during my post-graduation. Everyone knows Professor K.P. Morwani from Nanavati Hospital. So I might uh, might even be presumptuous to say one of the, he's the gentleman who's one probably the father of lateral skull based surgery in India and who's uh, given us so much uh, through his knowledge and through his workshops. And finally, this man, the man who changed my life forever, Professor Mario Sana from Group Autologico. I can't just thank him enough for everything that I learned from him, not only about autology and lateral skull based surgery, but also life uh, when I had the good fortune of uh, being with him for the for, for, from 2002 and 2003. Okay, so Professor Andre Sultan uh, from France used to say that the best way to learn the anatomy, or rather there are only three ways to learn the anatomy of the temporal bone, and that is through dissection, through dissection, and through dissection. And the same holds true for uh, reading an HRCT temporal bone. You have to be very, very confident. You have to ha know the, uh, the an anatomy of, uh, of the temporal bone inside out, three-dimensionally, not just a unidimensional knowledge, but three-dimensionally for you to understand CT temporal bone, or rather to master it without a very strong footing or grounding as far as the three-dimensional anatomy of the temporal bone is concerned. Trying to read uh, an HRCT is like trying to get onto an aircraft flight but not know how to land it. And the only way you can do that is through dissection. So friends, colleagues, whichever part of the world you may be in, you will, if you wish to master temporal bone, the place to start is the dissection lab. And I again would be very, not very wrong when I say that the temporal bone, this small little bone that we have, probably harbors the most dense concentration of vital structures within a small area. I am not very sure if there is any other part of the human body which has so many important structures, if we can sort of calculate it in the in the unit of say structures per square centimeters or per or rather per cubic centimeters or cubic millimeters. I mean, what don't you have there as far as the temporal bone and its image, its surroundings are concerned? Let, I'm not talking just about the ossicles of the or the tympanic membrane, you have the facial nerve, you have the labyrinth with its three semicircular canals, the vestibule, the cochlea, you have the brain, both the middle cranial fossa and the posterior cranial fossa, you have, a, you have two major vascular structures, the sigmoid or the lateral sinus posteriorly and the internal carotid artery anteriorly. And uh, I mean, you have the glossopharyngeal nerve, the lower cranial nerves in very, very close proximity. So you have a very, very dense concentration of structures and it is this density of these structures which makes the anatomy of the temporal bone so, so, so complex. And once again, to reiterate, and I'll probably keep, it, keep on reiterating it till, my third, till the third lecture that we have next week, and that is the only way to master CT or any imaging uh, modality of the temporal bone is through dissection. Right. So... We all know that uh, we read a CT uh, in actual coronal and sagittal planes. This is not to discuss that. What is it is what it is meant to discuss is the position of the patient. Now, this has changed drastically over the years. This is the patient lying down supine for the actual cuts, and this is the hyperextended uh, the hyperextended neck position of the patient for coronal cuts. Fortunately, in today's world of uh, very very good digital processing of the data. The particularly uh, uh, uncomfortable position of hyperextension is not needed and it's uh, the images or rather the data is acquired only in the supine position and then it's reformatted both in coronal and sagittal planes. So on the one hand you have the situation scenario wherein you don't need to 
hyperextend the neck of the patient. And this is particularly important if the patient has an advanced cervical spondylitis or the or ankylosing spondylitis. spondylitis. But where, there, when you have something, there's always a trade-off. And the trade-off is that reformatted images are slightly inferior to images which are actually acquired. I have had the fortune of uh, seeing both non-reformatted images uh, in the earlier part of my career, and now I see the formatted images. And I somehow personally feel that the non-formatted images, which are actually acquired in this hyperextended position, are a little better in resolution. Anyway, that's just to give you an idea as to what the position of the patient used to be as far as the coronal sections are concerned. So as I just mentioned, we have the actual plane, the coronal plane, and the sagittal plane, and we'll be taking on each of them individually uh, as far as HRCT of the temporal bone is concerned. Now, uh, we, before we dive into the actual slices of HRCT temporal bone, there are certain basic considerations or certain philosophies that I usually propagate and I feel are very good at mastering and not only mastering at at identifying the structures correctly on CT scan. And the first and the most important is always read the scan or the study in its entirety. I mean, take all the images and, and look at them serially rather than just picking up an, a single slice and trying to analyze what the structures are. You might identify most of these structures correctly even on a single slice, but the chances are you could make an error. So never ever try to be heroic. Heroism has no role in medicine. It's always prudence and logic. So uh, always try to read your scans in a sequential manner and always write, try to read the study in its entirety. Now, as far as reading your scans in the sequential manner is, con are, is concerned, personally, uh, from the point of view of the actual slices, I always prefer the slices to be read superior to inferior. That is, from superior from down. And before that, this red line that you saw is basically the axis of the study as far as temporal bone is concerned. It's called the orbitomiatal plane. So the orbitomiatal plane is the plane along which either perpendicular or parallel to it is the HRCT studied. So the actual scans are parallel to the, uh, let me go back once again, are parallel to the uh, orbitomiatal plane. And in my opinion, always go down superior to inferior. Why? I'll let, I mean, you'll understand that as in when we discuss the scans. But surprisingly, I have found that most of the plates that are provided by our radiology friends and our radiology centers, they usually provide the images uh, in the reverse manner. That is the inferior images, as far as the actual scans are concerned, the inferior images are given early first and then the uh, superior images. But I always try reading them the other way around. Now, as far as the coronal images are concerned, I always prefer reading them from posterior to anterior rather than anterior to posterior. Again, usually that's the way in which the plates are provided to us. And I'll give you all the secret. It's no rocket science. Uh, the, the whole fact is, the entire fact is that as you go from superior to inferior and from posterior to anterior in axial and coronal scans uh, respectively, you see the, uh, the number of structures earlier initially are lesser. And as you start identifying those structures, it becomes easier for you to identify the other structures which are coming into the subsequent slices. Moreover, one structure will always lead you to the other. So it's like the structure is hand holding you and taking you forward in trying to help you identify the, uh, the structures. So remember, coronal from posterior to anterior. And as you can see from this uh, particular uh, animation that the coronal scans are perpendicular to the orbitomiator line. And the last most important uh, philosophy remember and something that goes in my opinion a long way in helping you identify the structures are that structures which are parallel to the section or rather parallel to the plane of the structure uh, of the section are seen in its entirety and structures which are perpendicular to the plane of the slice that you're observing are seen circular and i'll again use a bit of a graphic uh, to help you understand this now suppose this is a structure that this is the structure that you're trying to identify on a ct scan 
and this structure is vertically oriented now what's this this is obviously the plane of the, the, the patient now what is the plane uh, that you are uh, using as far as the coronal is concerned on a coronal section this particular structure is parallel the coronal is a vertical uh, is in the vertical plane so this structure which is vertically oriented is parallel to the plane in which you are trying to identify it so you are going to see it as a longitudinal structure you are going to see this entire length of the structure on a coronal plane which is parallel to the coronal plane but the same structure because it's perpendicular to the actual plane you just see it as a circular shadow mind you it's not a spherical shadow the difference between a circle and a sphere i need not elaborate but still a sphere is a three dimensional structure and a circle is a two dimensional structure now let's reverse the scenario let's take a structure which is horizontal now when the structure is horizontal it becomes parallel to the actual scan to the plane of the actual scan and now you see the structure in its entirety or as a longitudinal shadow but on the other hand on a coronal section it becomes a circular shadow and i'll give you two examples to help you understand this now this is the horizontal part of the internal carotid artery the internal carotid artery in the temporal bone has three parts the vertical part which enters from the posterior for the foramen lacerum then the genu and finally the horizontal part which moves forward and comes out of the anterior foramen lacerum before entering into the uh, cavernous sinus so anyway so that's the horizontal part of the internal carotid artery now the horizontal part of the internal carotid artery is parallel to the actual scan and hence we are seeing it as a longitudinal shadow but the same structure because it's perpendicular to the coronal to a coronal scan becomes circular in shape right similarly the mastoid segment of the vertical segment of the facial nerve now that is parallel to a coronal section and therefore we see it as a long shadow whereas the same structure because it becomes perpendicular to the actual scan becomes a circular shadow so remember these few things always always in your mind what's the plane the what's your what's your reference line the orbitometer line the actual planes are parallel to the orbitometer line the coronal planes are perpendicular to the orbitometer line and the coronal and the sagittal images these days are reformatted images and anything parallel complete shadow anything perpendicular circular shadow with that we dive straight into the sections but before we move into these sections now to give you an idea of how of what all are is expected as far an actual scan is concerned this is a bone i have dissected many many years ago and what i have done is this is a temporal bone of the left side and you are looking at it from the top think of the of it as a fact that you're sitting in the temporal lobe and looking down on the temporal uh, on the uh, on the temporal bone after removing the temporal lobe and what i have done here is i have drilled a large part of the tegmen and the roof of the temporal bone so what all can we see this is the external auditory canal this being the external auditory canal somewhere here is your tympanic membrane this is the head of the magnus this is the body of the incus with the short process you can actually see the long process of the incus turning into the lenticular process this is the cochleariform process along with the tensor tympani this is the anterior attic area anterior to the external auditory canal this is the glenoid fossa with the mandibular condyle this is the posterior wall of the external auditory canal anterior wall obviously and this is the mastoid antrum with all the air cells which have been removed you can see the digastric ridge over here at the lower part of the mastoid antrum mastoid bone and you can see the vertical part of the facial nerve here now this is the vertical part of the facial nerve you can see i have gray lined the lateral semicircular canal i have gray lined the posterior canal and i have gray lined the superior semicircular canal now moving anteriorly we can see the internal auditory canal here and this is anteriorly in the superior part of the internal auditory canal we have a facial nerve now if we trace the facial nerve this is the intracanalicular part of the facial nerve this is the intralabyrinthine part of the facial nerve which lies between the superior semicircular canal and this is the cochlea here i've just opened up the uh, basal turn of the cochlea so this is the labyrinthine part of the facial nerve and this labyrinthine part of the facial nerve is then turn, turning backwards with the genicular ganglion in the tympanic segment obviously the other nerve that you see here is the superior vestibular nerve we are not visualizing the nerves which are in the inferior compartment of the internal auditory canal and here to this is the petrous apex which could be either bone marrow or an air cell or otherwise this is the horizontal part of the internal carotid artery what you see here as an extra sheath 
is uh, what I have done is you see the internal carotid artery. If you look at it head on, the internal carotid artery with its genica and everything is finally surrounded by what we call a periarterial plexus. So there is a venous plexus, a thick venous plexus around the internal carotid artery. So this is that thick venous plexus that I have dissected out. You can actually see the blue coloration of the venous plexus and the reddish coloration of the internal carotid artery. And finally, this is the trigeminal ganglion or the gasserian ganglion in the Meckel scale. So remember, try thinking, keeping this in, uh, image in mind so that you can identify these structures better. Okay. So that's the first section that we see on uh, the actual scans and uh, all these scans are from the mind you from the right side because we read the actual scans from the foot end of the patient right so let's start identifying the structures and for your reference i've put in this structure this uh, dissected picture of uh, again I, a dissection that i had performed many many years ago a dissected picture of the three semicircular canals and the cochlea over here so that we can take a reference over here as to which part of the labyrinth are we seeing. Now this scan is, is an actual scan and is somewhere here. Okay, it's somewhere here. So this scan being somewhere here, what are we seeing? I always try identifying the labyrinthine block first, always. Why? Because that helps me identify the other structures better. At least that's my personal opinion. So let's try try start out the way I usually do, so that you can see the compact, dense, compact bone around the labyrinthine structure uh, of the labyrinthine block. Now, what we see here is a dumbbell-shaped shadow. Okay. Before we move on to uh, discussing these structures, simple fact: most of you know it. Iso, hypo, and hyper. Sorry. So, ISO is the same intensity as brain. Obviously, hypo is less than intensity, less than brain, that is air or fluid. And hyper is bone, that is intensity, more than brain. Okay, so we, we have hypo intensity, hyper intensity, and hypo iso intensity in, uh, on CT scan. So the labyrinthine block is obviously hyper intensity made of bone. Bone is hyper intense, brain is high, iso intense, fluid and air is iso, uh, is hypo intense. So we see a hypo intense struct shadow because obviously we know that end of the day, the labyrinth is either uh, of, is, is fluid uh, filled, that is both peri or endolymph. So we see a dumbbell shaped structure there is a slightly bulbous structure, a bulbous shadow anteriorly, a bulbous shadow posteriorly, and then there is a thin arm connecting the two shadows. So this bulbous structure anteriorly is the anterior limb of the superior semicircular canal. This is the posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal, and this is the dome of the superior semicircular canal connecting the anterior and the posterior limbs. So you've identified the superior semicircular canal on an actual scan that's one of the first that's the first structure that you identify going superior to inferior besides that what else do we see we see a very early part of the mastered antrum here we see the periantral air cells with its trabeculations we see the tegmen now mind you right now we are at the tegmen mastoidea because we are looking at the uh, mastoid uh, bone, right? There are two parts to the tegmen, tegmen mastoidea and tegmen antri, and the difference is appreciated better on coronal sections rather than on uh, actual sections. And we'll take a look at, uh, we'll talk about it when we move on to the coronal sections. But this is the tegmen. If this is the tegmen, this is the middle cranial fossa. This is the posterior cranial fossa. This is the posterior face of the petrus. This is the entire petrus pyramid. Right? This is the entire petrous pyramid. So this is the posterior face of the petrous bone, and this is the lateral sinus. I prefer calling the I prefer the term lateral sinus rather than the sigmoid sinus, but then everyone can have their own um, um, own uh, fancies. So that's the lateral sinus. So this is the posterior canal fossa. This is the petrous apex. Now you gradually find the petrous apex moving anteriorly as we go down. Why? Because we'll have to finally reach the petrous you know, occipital synchondrosis. That is also known as the clivus, the junction between the petrous apex, the basi occiput, and the wing of the sphenoid body of the sphenoid and the wing of the sphenoid. But you can still, in spite of that, see the sphenoid uh, sinus over here. So don't just stay restricted. What I, why did I point the rest of the structures here is, don't stay restricted to identifying the tempo, the structures within the temporal bone. See if you can glean some more information from the rest of the scan, right? So that's the first, usually the first cut slice of the actual scan that you encounter. And as I said, 
since we had to identify just one structure and if we have a solid knowledge of, of anatomy doesn't say make i mean it makes life much much more easier now we've moved one step down since we've moved one step down we left the dome behind and we've come somewhere here we've come somewhere here so from the previous uh, from the previous uh, slice wherein we had two uh, dumbbell shaped uh, shadow now we have just two circular shadows right remember perpendicular parallel circular and uh, uh, longitudinal so now we just have two iso intense shadows one anteriorly one posteriorly thereby this is the anterior limb of the superior and this is the posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal the mastoid antrum slightly becoming bigger in size because it's a slightly wider space than what is seen i mean wider space a little inferiorly than what is seen in the superior part the periantral air cells the middle cranial fossa the uh, tegmen the petrous apex okay the posterior cranial fossa the posterior face of the petrous bone this lateral sinus and obviously you can still see a part of the sigma uh, the sphenoid sinus over here and you can find see that the sphenoid sinus, the petrous apex is moving more medially and also you find a small dimpling over here why because we have to be prepared for the fact that gradually as we move down we'll start encountering the internal auditory canal besides that we also see an air cell here this is a apical a petrous apical cell or a retrolabyrinthine air cell which can get involved in diseases like cholesteatoma cholesterol granuloma but more of that later on now we've moved one step further down we've come here now, if you see clearly, my uh, my line here over here is passing through this dimple between the anterior limb and the posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal. So, can we see the dimple here? Right. So, we can see this dimple here. So, we have the anterior part of anterior limb of the superior canal, the posterior limb of the superior canal, and we can see this dimple in between the anterior and the posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal. All of us, I mean, or, or rather, the, my, my friends here, juniors and colleagues and otherwise, who are here and who are otologists know very well what this dimpling is all about. This harbors the subarcuate artery, a bleeding that we encounter on and off while performing a mastoid surgery. So this is the dimple of the subarcuate artery. But you do not call on, action, on CT scan of temporal bone. You do not identify this as the subarcuate artery because mind you, what you're seeing here, we all know that the, the soft tissue differentiation of CT scans is extremely poor. So what you call this here, what, are, what you're actually seeing is the bony canal which harbors the subarcuate artery and that is called the petromastoid canal so on radio in radiology terms in ct radiology terms we are you call this canal which we will gradually find extending up to the posterior face of the petrous bone as the petromastoid canal why because it extends from the petrous to the mastoid cavity and it harbors the subarcuate artery. So this is radiologically the petromastoid canal harboring the subarcuate artery. Again, for repetition's sake, the mastoid antrum, the periantral air cells, the middle, the tegmen, the middle cranial fossa, the posterior face of the petrous bone, the lateral sinus. Now, friends, can you see the petrous apex gradually coming in contact with the sphenoid, uh, the sphenoid bone? The sphenoid sinus and you can see the beginning of the internal auditory canal which is the meatus the medial end of the internal auditory canal mind you the medial end of the internal auditory canal is usually always early visible earlier on ct axial than the uh, the fundus or the rest of the canal so this is the beginning of the meatus of the internal auditory canal okay we move one step down further now that we move one step down further, we are able to see the petromastoid canal in its entirety, right? The, because And because it contains a soft tissue, it is iso-intense, its signal is iso-intense. So to recapitulate, anterior limb of the superior, posterior limb of the superior, the dimple between the anterior and the posterior limb with a few air cells, and then this dimple leading from the mastoid from the mastoid to the posterior face of the petrous as the petromastoid canal with the subarcuate artery. The periantral air cells and the mastoid antrum, the middle cranial fossa, 
the tegmen, the posterior fossa plate or rather petrous apex plate, the lateral sinus. But now let's pay a little more attention to this area. So I wasn't misleading you earlier when I said that the previous dimple is of the internal auditory canal, the meatus, because see, you are following these scans sequentially and therefore life is already becoming easier for you, right? So you can now actually see the beginning of the internal auditory canal, that is the meatus of the internal auditory canal, and we can see the petrous apex joining the sphenoid and now what do we see that compared to the previous scan we did get some isointense shadows here though the isointensity was not there earlier in the sub in the previous scans but in this scan we see this iso intense shadow in the petrous apex now the petrous apex normally a the petrous apices of the two sides need not be symmetrical and need not have the same content but what are the three normal uh, contents of the petrous apex? A, it can have, be an air cell, but this is not an air cell because if it had been an air cell, it would have been this shadow, which we'll talk about later on when we go to the pathologies in the uh, next lecture on Wednesday. So it could have been an air cell, but then the intensity doesn't match. It could be sclerous. That is, it could have been an extension of the rest of the bone, which in which case it would have been hyper intense, but it is iso intense, which means that basically it is fatty marrow. Now, that is usually what the normal constituency of the petrous apex is. It is usually made up of fatty marrow, and therefore, sorry, its intensity is high, uh, iso intense, and neither hypo, which is air cell, nor hyper, which is when it is sclerosed. Okay, so the rest of the structures we've identified. So that's the petrous apex joining the sphenoid bone. Right, now. One second. Okay, we move one step down. Now that we've come one step down, what has happened? What has happened is, We've come somewhere here. We've come somewhere here, but we are no longer scared. We are no longer scared, why? For the simple reason that we know our anatomy very well from the dissection and we've been reading these scans sequentially. So we have the anterior limb of the superior semicircular canal, but from the posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal, something is extending and also intense shadow is extending backwards, right? So from the posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal, a horizontal iso intense shadow or a shadow which is parallel to the plane of the axial section is extending backwards. So what can, there, can that be? This is the superior limb of the posterior semicircular canal. So we are seeing of the superior limb of the posterior semicircular canal, also seeing the end of the posterior limb. Oh, sorry, we are seeing the beginning of the, the superior limb of the posterior semicircular canal and the end of the posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal. So what is the junction of the posterior limb of the superior and the superior limb of the posterior? It is the cross commune. So we are actually at the level of the cross commune over here and the beginning of the posterior semicircular canal. So anterior part of the anterior limb of superior, the cross commune along with the posterior semicircular canal, the beginning of the posterior semicircular canal. Periantral shadow, peri sorry, mastered antrum, periantral shadows, uh, the air cells, and just keep, pay attention here. Can you see a plate of bone developing here? And can you see this entire area gradually getting an hourglass configuration? Our otologist friends would already probably have identified the area that I'm talking about, but we'll just talk about this more in details in the next few, next few slices. Again, tegmen, middle cranial fossa, posterior cranial fossa, posterior face, and the lateral sinus. But now, now, before we go on to the internal carotid artery, we find Petrus apex joining the sphenoid and the lateral wall of the sphenoid is showing us a smooth circular shadow. 
what is this this is the pre the intracavernous part of the internal carotid artery that is seen by endoscopic sinus surgeons in the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus. In fact, you can actually see the bony partition of the sphenoid sinus as well. Anyway, that's not the matter of discussion in today's talk, but now let's pay attention to the internal auditory canal. We can see the meatus of the internal auditory canal. This is the anterior lip of the meatus. Please pay attention over here. This is the anterior lip of the internal or meatus, and this is the posterior limb. And if I draw a line on the two of them, you have to pay attention to the angulation of the two lips. As you can see, the angulation of the anterior lip is obtuse, whereas the angulation of the posterior lip is acute. How does it matter? Though CT scan is not the gold standard for diagnosis of internal of uh, tumors of the uh, cerebellopontine angle like vestibular schwannoma or meningioma, still I just need you to know that the acute angulation of the posterior lip of the internal auditory meatus is lost. That is, it tends to become smoother and more rounded. It tends to become more rounded like this in case if it, or rather let me put it this way, that if you tend to see it more rounded or kind of uh, chopped off if, if it appears like this your index of suspicion should become very high that probably there is something going wrong in the cerebellopontine angle but then having said that the investigation of choice is MRI with gadolinium obviously this is the petrus apex with the marrow and we've already identified the labyrinthine block here next scan things become more complicated friends I hope now that now you've started realizing why I kept on stressing on the fact that we need to read the actual scans from superior to inferior because structures tend to start tend to appear more and more and then because we've identified the, the structures in the previous scans we are able to identify these structures in the subsequent ones as, as I said it's like these structures are hand holding us and leading us to the next structure right now where have we come we've come somewhere here we've come somewhere here so the anterior limb of the superior is gradually going out of picture but we see something horizontally extending laterally towards the antrum or the middle ear cavity right so this is the iso intense shadow of the lateral semicircular canal and again our otologist friends would agree that when we do a mastoid exploration we drill this outer cortical outer cortex of bone we remove the periantral air cells and the first structure that we see is the lateral semicircular canal right but before that because this was cross commune this one or probably this one is the ampullated end the superior semicircular canal right this is the anterior end of the superior semicircular canal so this is the ampullated end again because this is the beginning of the lateral semicircular canal so this is the ampullated end of the superior semi of the lateral semicircular canal but this was the non ampullated end of both the superior and the posterior as the cross commune so we are still at the non ampullated end or the cross commune uh, the non ampulated of the superior and the posterior or the cross commune, but we can see the superior extending backwards. So we are still at the upper limb of the, of the posterior extending backwards and going downwards subsequently. Moreover, moreover, what we see here is an eye so intense shadow which seems to want to extend from here and here, and the two that meet here, right? So this is the beginning of the vestibule. Where do all the semicircular canals open? They open into the vestibule. So this is the appearance of the vestibule. So we have the lateral, ampulated, ampulated superior, cross commune, and posterior. Fair enough. We have the outer hump of the lateral semicircular canal as seen while doing a mastoid exploration. Now we get some interesting structures within the middle ear cavity. What do we see? We see two irregular shaft structures, anterior and posterior, one anterior and one posterior. So this one is the head of the malleus, and this is just the beginning of the body of the incus. So this is the head of the malleus along with the body of the incus, right? So <clears throat> just a sec, friends. Okay, so.
Yeah. So So this is the body of the ballias and the head of the incus. Now, can you appreciate this thin plate of bone better? This is the thin plate of bone, which is the lateral wall of the attic and later, or rather the mastoid, and later on would continue downwards as the lateral wall of the attic. All of us, we know it as the scutum. So this is the beginning of the scutum. So an erosion here would make you, and some iso intense shadow in the gap over here would help you understand that probably there is a cholesterol tumor here, correct? So this is the lateral wall of the mastoid, which would gradually become the lateral wall of the, uh, uh, of the attic. In fact, this is the beginning of the attic area. This is the beginning of the attic area with the incudomaleolar joint, the upper part of the incudomaleolar joint. Now, what else do we see? We see a plate of bone just anterior across, uh, from the head of the malleus, stretching across from the lateral wall to the medial wall, and we all know it as the cog importance of the cog we could as you can in fact you can see here there is an air cell just anterior to the cog i don't know suddenly the eraser is uh, not working i don't know what's wrong anyway so okay Okay, so this is the cog with the anterior, with this air cell anterior to the cog, and we all know that in case this is iso, I mean, how does the CT help here? If we see this occupied by iso intense shadow, we need, we know that there is cholesterol here, and also it is very important for us while do, while performing a surgery to remove this part of bone, lest we leave, leave behind residual cholesterol Okay, right now we move. Uh, we obviously know these are the periantral air cells, the middle cranial fossa with the tegment, the posterior cranial fossa, the lateral sinus, the posterior face of the petrous bone. And you can see the external auditory canal gradually developing here with the external car carotid uh, ca uh, canal gradually developing here. Okay. But along with that, let's now pay attention to the internal auditory canal because that has undergone a sea of change. Okay. That has undergone a sea of change. Okay, so what do we see here? We see the entire internal auditory canal. We've already spoken about the meatus. This is the anterior lip, the posterior lip, the obtuse angle and the acute angle. Remember, we are still at the upper part of the internal auditory canal. Now, before we move, we'll talk about the internal, more about the internal auditory canal, we need to know what does the fundus look like? The fundus, when seen head on, Right, and this is the fundus of the right internal artery canal. The fundus, when seen head on, we know that the fundus is divided by a transverse crest into an upper, superior, and an inferior part. This is anterior, this is posterior, this is superior, this is inferior. Right, so we have a transverse crest dividing into a superior and an inferior compartment, and then we have a vertical crest in honor of Bill, William House of House Senior Institute, also known as the Bill as Bill's Bar. So we have three compartments because of two crests at the fundus of the internal auditory canal, correct? This is the, the fundus that we're talking about. Anterior in the anterior superior compartment is the facial nerve. In the posterior superior compartment is the superior vestibular nerve. Don't worry, I'm not going to do this. No, I'm not doing that, right? Okay, so we have the facial nerve and the superior vestibular nerve. And then we have the foramina for the cochlear nerve in a spiral manner in the antero inferior compartment. And we have one larger foramina for the inferior vestibular nerve and a slightly smaller foramina for the division of the inferior vestibular nerve to the ampulla of the posterior semicircular canal known as the foramen for the singular nerve. So this is the basic division of the internal auditory canal, the, uh, the fundus end of the internal auditory canal. And this is very, very important for you to remember. So, now we have reached the fundus of the internal artery canal but in the upper part. Because we are in the upper part, what are the two nerves that we should be able to identify? The facial nerve anteriorly and the superior vestibular nerve posteriorly. Are we doing that? Yes. We can see this channel of bone here. So this is the channel for the facial nerve. Then we can see a small channel extending backwards. This is the channel from wherein the superior vestibular nerve will enter and go towards the lateral the superior and the utricle. And, and if you pay attention, 
you see a triangular piece of bone between the facial anterior and the superior vestibular posterior and this is the vertical crest friends remember for the vertical crest it is the axial section which is better and for the transverse it is the coronal section which we'll discuss when we go to the coronal sections so but this is the vertical crest at the fundus of the internal artery canal now if this is the vertical crest this is the canal for the facial nerve we all know the divisions of the facial nerve let's but to recapitulate we have the intrasternal the cisternal part of the facial nerve the part which comes out of the brain stem and the part before the meatus that's the cisternal part then we have the part of the facial nerve which is within the canal which is called the intracanalicular part from the intracanalicular part, the facial nerve enters into the facial canal, which is anterior to the superior semicircular canal. Remember that dissection picture? And somewhere here will be your cochlea and the subsequent scans. So it is between the superior canal posteriorly and the basal turn of the cochlea anteriorly. So this is called the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve. And then it turns backwards. And so, friends, this is the geniculate ganglion. So this is the intra meatal the the intracanalicular part and this is the in the labyrinthine segment along with the jugular ganglion now we know that the cog always points towards the tympanic segment of the facial nerve and towards the processus cochlear formis so is our anatomy matching here yes it is so trans vertical crest facial superior vestibular nerve I hope, friends, till now, nothing is, uh, I mean, most of it is clear to you and we are moving at a speed at which you're able to comprehend. Rest of the structures, middle cranial fossa, tegmen, posterior fossa, posterior face, lateral sinus, petrous apex with marrow, petrous phenoid synchondrosis, phenoid sinus, and the, uh, the internal, internal carotid artery on the lateral wall. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, slice little more inferior a little more inferior but any, any trouble here no none whatsoever none whatsoever oops i'm sorry i'm sorry sorry none whatsoever why because we we be going in a very very uh, sequence in a very very organized manner and therefore we'll be able to identify again let's start off with the labyrinthine block we are now somewhere here we are now somewhere here so we see literally the entire signet ring appearance of the lateral semicircular canal yes so anterior is ampullated posterior is non-ampullated but now the posterior has become a circular shadow because we are at the trunk of the or the limb of the posterior semicircular canal which is perpendicular to the actual scan so this is the posterior this is the signet ring appearance and this is the entire vestibule this is the entire vestibule okay now what happens anterior to the vestibule? We see the basal turn of cochlea. Remember, both for axial scans and coronal scans, the basal turn of cochlea is first to appear and the last to disappear. The first to appear and the last to disappear. And also, I remember I told you in the previous slice, the labyrinthine segment anterior to which is the basal turn of the cochlea and posterior to which was the superior semicircular canal. So again, our anatomy is matching and we can still see the canal for the superior vestibular nerve and we can still see this triangular piece of bone, which is the vertical crest. Now we've gone a little down, a little inferior, so we can see the tympanic segment of the facial nerve better with the cog pointing towards the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. You know your anatomy and there is no way you're making a mistake as far as CT scan is concerned. Coming more laterally, do we see the incus and the malleus now? Yes, we do. We see the malleus, the head of the malleus with its dimple here. We see the body of the incus along with its short process. And in fact, we can actually see the joint in between two, between the two of them. And this entire appearance, all our radiological friends and our otologist friends know is called the ice cream cone appearance. The ice cream cone appearance, this is the head of the malleus. We'll go back to the previous to the previous slide again. Just to give you an idea, this is the head of the malleus. This is the lateral process of the malleus. This is the handle of the malleus. This is the 
anterior process of the malleus, the body of the incus, the short process and the long process of the incus. And now if we look at it from top, we see the head of the malleus, body of incus, short process along in the ice cream cone appearance. So this is the typical ice cream cone appearance with the cog anteriorly. And look at the size of the air cell that is anterior to the cog. So this is very, very important. Identify the cog because if there is a cog, there is a possibility that you could have pathology anterior to the cog and in, a, in case you're not aware of it, you could stop your surgery here and leave behind residual cholesteatoma. Internal or ex external auditory canal now developing here. You can see this canalization that occurs here with the ISO intense shadow. So the external auditory canal developing here and can and now do you agree the, to the fact that this is the scutum. This is the internal incudomalleolar joint housed within the attic and this is the lateral attic wall or the scutum. So this becomes a little lower down the area of Cruzac's space. And now we have the typical R glass configuration of the attic anteriorly, the mastoid antrum posteriorly, and the aditus ad antrum in between the R glass configuration of the attic aditus and the adit and the antrum. And again, when we drill from here, when we do a mastoid exploration, the lateral semicircular canal is the first one that we visualize. The middle cranial fossa with the tegmen. Now you can start calling it the tegmen mastoid, I mean the tegmen tympani because we've come to the attic, the posterior face of the temple of the uh, petrous bone, the lateral sinus. This is still the posterior limb, the lip of the internal auditory meatus, uh, <clears throat> the anterior lip of the internal Meters, the petrous apex for with the marrow and the rest of the structures. Okay, we move further down. Remember, remember, remember from here, from here, we are coming here. So this will disappear, these will start disappearing. That is the facial and the superior vestibular nerve. And what we we'll start seeing is the cochlear and the inferior vestibular nerve. But mind you, the cochlear nerve appears as a single as multiple foramina. Please remember that. Okay, so we've come down in more. Since we've come down more, we now see the vestibule, a slight, I mean, much more larger compared to what we were seeing of the vestibule earlier, right? We see the vestibule, but we don't see the entire lateral mainly see its body non-ampulated part. We mainly see the body and the non-ampulated part, and we also see the posterior semicircular canal, but as a circular shadow. But what is it that develops, seems to be developing here? What is it that seems to be developing here? A canal with an ISO intense shadow. Now pay, pay attention here, friends. Pay attention here. What is the structure which is medial to the posterior semicircular canal extending backwards towards the posterior face of the petrous bone? That is the endolymphatic sac. So what we are actually seeing is the shadow of the endolymphatic sac and duct system. Endolymphatic sac and duct system. But again, radiologically on CT, you do not call it the endolymphatic sac. Neither do you call it the endolymphatic duct because it's the bony shadow that is visible, the bony canal which is visible. And hence you call it the vestibular aqueduct. Please remember this for posterity. On CT, do not label this as an endolymphatic sac or a sac or endolymphatic duct. It is called the vestibular aqueduct. Please remember that. Never ever forget it. So right posterior to the posterior semicircular canal, the limb of the posterior semicircular canal, we start seeing the bony channel which houses the endolymphatic sac and duct, sac and duct details of which we'll discuss probably during the MRI section, uh, MRI uh, lecture, or maybe during the pathologies. But we see the vestibular aqueduct. Again, Let's talk about what is happening anteriorly. What is happening anteriorly? We see the basal turn of the cochlea, right? But we also start seeing a faint shadow of the middle turn of the cochlea, right? As I said, basal turn of the cochlea first to appear and the last to disappear. So this will persist. But we also start seeing the middle turn of the cochlea. But at the same time, from the fundus of the internal artery canal, are we seeing something, an ISO intense shadow, extending from the fundus of the internal artery canal towards the basal turn of the cochlea? So this is the canal for the cochlear nerve. And if this is the canal for the cochlear 
the nerve. That's the axis around which the cochlea rotates or the cochlea spins. So this is also the modulus. Remember, so this is the channel or the canal for the cochlear nerve and hence the modulus. And this bony partition, this bony partition that you see between the, the, the basal turn of the cochlea and the middle turn of the cochlea is called the interscalar septum. Please remember that the interscalar septum is different from the osseous spiral lamina, something which we'll discuss in details in our MRI lecture. But this, the, I, but I'll just give you a bit of a di difference between the two because you need to understand the difference to appreciate the, uh, the next few scans. Interscalar septum is just bone. It's the bone which divides the basal turn from the middle and the middle from the apical, apical turn. It's just bone. But the osseous spiral lamina is the bone. Again, that also extends from medial to la from, from the center of the cochlea laterally. But the osseous spiral lamina is the bone which extends from the from the or the modulus laterally, but it is spongy bone because besides some connective tissue and some very fine capillaries, it contains the spiral ganglion of the cochlear nerve. So the difference between the osseous spiral lamina that is that it is more spongy in nature, whereas as interscalar septum, which is the which is the dividing partition between the middle and the apical and the basal, the basal and the middle and the apical turns is just bone. And on CT, you always you usually see the interscalar septum unless and until it's a very very high high resolution. Seeing osseous spiral lamina is slightly difficult on CT scans. And again, anyway, to come back, so this is the basal turn of the cochlea along with the foramen of the cochlear nerve. Now, do we see the facial nerve anymore or rather the labyrinthine segment of the geniculate ganglion? No, but what we definitely see is more or less the entire length of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. So this is the entire length of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Given isolatedly, I might have made a mistake. I might have thought, with all due respect, I might have thought that this is the facial nerve, or maybe the facial nerve is lost somewhere here. But because I've been going from superior to inferior, I know that this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. The other reason I know it is that the tympanic segment of the facial nerve at the second genu will turn downwards, and the second genu is in close proximity to the lateral semicircular canal. Okay, middle cranial fossa, petrous apex, internal carotid artery, marrow, posterior fossa lateral sinus but at the same time observe here that there is an iso intense shadow a clearance of the hyper intense shadow that is developing here why because right anterior to the external artery canal is the mass the glenoid fossa with the, the mandibular condyle so this bone is going to thin out and get converted into the, the tympanic bone the bone that we usually drill while doing a canal plasty but more of that later on and also see how the cog has disappeared because the cog is usually a constituent of the attic but also see how the inter external artery canal has got channelized more thereby thinning out this wall here which is the scutum this is the hand, head of the malleus body of inca short process and see how thin the attic has now become. Okay, we move further down. We move more and more further down and we see a huge change, a huge change. I'll, I'll straight away jump to the facial nerve here. But why? 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 Simply because if again given isolatedly, I could have identified the facial nerve as this one, but I know that that's not the facial nerve. The facial nerve is here. That's the second genu of the facial nerve. So if this is the facial nerve, what is this? This is the tendon of the tensor tympani muscle, the canal for the tensor tympani muscle, which then turns laterally. Can you see this rim of bone? So this is the cochlearyform process, the most robust bone within the temporal bone. So this is the cochlearyform process. And this thin, thin, projection that you see here is the tendon of the tensor tympani tendon uh, of the tensor tympani muscle extending towards the neck of the malleus. So the tensor tympani, the cochlearyform form process and the tendon going towards the, the neck of the malleus. So this is the lower part of the malleus, lower down from the head, the neck. And this is now when we start seeing the lenticle, the long process of the incus as a circular shadow because this is perpendicular. So from our 
uh, sequential sections, we were able to identify the fact that this is the facial nerve, the mastoid segment or the second genu. This is the posterior semicircular canal here. And now can you see the vestibular aqueduct much more clearly, medial to the posterior semicircular canal. You, we do not see any part of the lateral semicircular canal, but we see the vestibule. Now, because we see the vestibule, can you also see that the vestibule is trying to open up laterally? into the tympanic cavity. So going superior to inferior, what's the first opening of the vestibule, which is directed laterally? That's the oval window. So you can actually see the upper part of the foot plate of the stapes over here. This thin plate of bone is the upper part of the foot plate of stapes. So that's the, the, the vestibule opening laterally towards the middle ear cavity. So that's the foot plate of the stapes. Let's move anterior. We see that more medially, the internal auditory meatus is now sort of trying to disappear, and so it's becoming hyper intense. But what do we see here? We see the cochlea. We see the basal turn of the cochlea. We see the middle turn of the cochlea, and then we see this bony partition between the basal turn and the middle turn. So this again is the interscalar septum rather than the osseous spiral lamina. Remember that, please. Okay, so this is the interscalar septum, not the osseous spiral lamina. The osseous spiral lamina would be like that. And so the part superior to it would be the scala vestibuli, and the part inferior to it would be the scala tympani. So this is the inter scalar septum and the osseous spiral lamina with the basal membrane, basal, basal membrane would be here with the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. And now you can see the widened foramina for the cochlear nerve and this is the modulus. And we can see the interscalar septum uh, stretching, extending laterally from the modulus, correct? Besides that, we also see a canal developing posteriorly. So this now, because we are at the level of the cochlear nerve, is the canal for the inferior vestibular nerve. Seeing the canal for the singular nerve can be possible, might be possible, might not be possible in all, all actual scans. It all depends upon the resolution that has been provided to you. Okay, let's come laterally. We saw the head of the malleus, rather the handle of the malleus and the long process. And so this is the scutum, the lowest part of the lateral attic wall. So this is the area of the Prusak space. We know that the area of the Prusak space is in close proximity to the neck of the malleus. And how do we know that we are at the level of the neck of the malleus is because of the tensor tympani. External auditory canal, glenoid fossa of the uh, temporomandibular joint, the posterior fossa along with the lateral sinus, the middle cranial fossa, the tegment tympani, the petrous apex and the rest of the structures. Okay moved down further inferiorly moved down further inferiorly now before i forget this is probably the singular nerve canal not very sure but you could identify in some other scans better resolution scans but this was the canal for the inferior vestibular nerve the the main canal and this now is the canal for the inferior, uh, the, that part of the inferior vestibular nerve which is uh, sub, uh, supplying or rather taking impulses from the uh, ampulla of the posterior canal. So this is the vestibule now, and now can you beautifully see the lateral uh, part of the, vest the vestibule opening laterally with the foot plate, the anterior crust, the posterior crust, and the head of the stapes. And this is the lenticular long process with the interior stapedial joint. Anterior to it, head of malleus. Now, I wasn't fooling you, right? When I said that this is the master, the genu or the beginning of the mastoid part of the temp of the uh, facial nerve. Why? Because now we can actually see the facial nerve better, but more of that later. But what we see here now, what we see here is this part of the posterior semicircular canal, the part of the, the inferior part of the posterior canal that is going to meet the vestibule. So this is the ampullated part of the posterior semicircular canal. And can you see the most medial part of the vestibular aqueduct, the opening of the, uh, the, the part? This is where, this is where the endolymphatic sac lies. This is where the endolymphatic sac lies on the posterior face, on the posterior face, uh, on the posterior face of the petrous pyramid, right? So this is where the endolymphatic sac lies. But as I said, this is called the vestibular aqueduct. And this lid of bone, the triangular lid of bone that you see covering as a lip, the vestibular aqueduct is called the operculum. In radiology terms, it's called the operculum, which means a covering, right? 
uh, fish have operculum over their over their uh, gills. So this is the operculum, is the thin triangular piece of bone which is the lip over the uh, vestibular aqueduct placed anteriorly. So this is the vestibule, the posterior semicircular canal with the aqueduct, vestibular aqueduct and the operculum. We'll come here later on. Let's finish this off. So basal turn cochlea, middle turn cochlea, apical turn of the cochlea with the interscalar septum. With the interscalar septum here and here, we can almost see, we can see that the inter- Mano, sir. Mano, yes, sir. Please. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt you in between. Sir, can you just uh, disable your renovation and again uh, enable it? There is okay. some little lag in between, sir. Okay. For that, I'll have to go out of the presentation and start the presentation again. Okay, sir. Fine, sir. Because okay. we are seeing escape. some lag in between. No, no problem. No problem. I'll just yes, do that. Sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, sir. It is perfectly fine now, sir. Yeah, I suppose you a lot go of ahead. annotations got uh, accumulated, you know. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. Just, just let me know. Whenever there's a problem, just let me know. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. Okay. Sir. Yes. Right. So, uh, the interscalar septum, both anteriorly, posteriorly, the internal artery canal more or less disappeared. We'll come here later on because this is a very, very important area. But we definitely know that the mastoid segment of the facial nerve is here and the mastoid segment being vertical or rather perpendicular to the actual scan is now seen as a circular shadow, but a nice robust shadow. And we have the middle cranial fossa, the posterior cranial fossa, the lateral sinus, the glenoid fossa, the tegmen, and the sphenoid sinus with the internal carotid artery. Why am I harping on the internal carotid artery? Because this is what will extend backwards as a horizontal part of the internal carotid artery. But let's discuss this area, an area which is of so much of importance both to otologists and to cochlear implant surgeons. Why? Because, and I call this the sleeping W sign because this is showing us both the facial recess and the sinus tympani. How? This is the tympanic annulus anterior tympanic annulus posterior. You can see the external artery canal, uh, the, the, the attic wall or the scutum has disappeared totally. So this is the ha handle of the malleus embedded within the tympanic membrane. Okay, so this is the annulus posteriorly. This is the pyramid at the base of which is the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. And this is the vestibule here along with the foot plate and the uh, the lateral wall of the vestibule along with the foot plate of the superstructure of the sleepy. So I call this the sleeping W sign. If you look carefully, it actually looks like a W. Or rather a W sign, not a sleeping W. Sorry, my, I beg your pardon. It's a W sign. So the apex of the W is formed by the pyramid with the mastoid segment at the uh, in its body. The, the left limb is formed by the tympanic annulus. The right limb by the foot plate or the lateral wall of the vestibule and so this is the facial recess and this is the sinus tympani right sinus tympani an area notorious for recidivism or residual cholesteatoma the deeper it is the more it makes life difficult for pathologists pathologists and mastoid surgeons and the facial recess why because this is the approach the cochlear implant surgeons take they put in they make the well here and then they they insert the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the electrodes through the posterior tympanotomy opening into the uh, uh, into the uh, cochleostomy that they create. Anyway, much of the, much of uh, more of that uh, maybe later on. So this is the most important output from this particular section, and that is the facial recess with the tympan with the sinus tympani. So anteriorly, what do we see? We see the tensor tympani. The soft tissue is that of the tensor tympani and just lateral to the tensor tympani is the, the medial end of the eustachian tube, correct? External artery canal and the rest of the structures we've already delineated earlier. Okay, next we move down. Now, nothing much uh, here to see in fact. I mean, the structures are disappearing because we are going down towards the lower part of the uh, temp temporal bone and we don't really have very many important structures. So the structures are disappearing now. The internal artery canal totally disappeared, but we now see the posterior semicircular canal going towards and meeting the vestibule. And therefore, this is the ampullated end. We still can see a part of the operculum of the vestibular aqueduct. 
we still see the basal turn with a thick interscalar septum, the middle turn, and the very thin interscalar septum along with the apical turn. But now what do we see? We see that the vestibule, or rather the, the oh no, no, I'm so sorry. Remember, we all know the foot plate is over the vestibule, the saccule of the vestibule, but the round window communicates with the scala tympani. So the cochlea is trying to open up posteriorly. We can see an air cell. So we can see a small air cell here, and the cochlea is trying to open posteriorly. Second opening of the labyrinth, inferiorly and directed posteriorly, round window. Very quickly, first opening of the, of the labyrinth, I'm intentionally using the word labyrinth because both the openings are not of the vestibule. The first opening of the labyrinth from the vestibule laterally faced the oval window. The second opening of the labyrinth from the scala posteriorly faced the round window. So this will be the round window niche. You'll see it much better on the later sections, but this is the beginning of the round window niche. The mastoid segment of the facial nerve, again, one could have easily confused whether this is the facial nerve or this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, but we are not confused because we're moving superior to inferior. The eustachian tube, the handle of the malleus, you can always see the handle of a malleus either as a circular shadow or slightly an oblong shadow, depending upon the fact whether there is some kind of a medialization of the tympanic membrane. So here, probably because there is some medialization, you see the handle of the malleus as a longitudinal shadow. This would be the area of the tympanic membrane. You can still see the facial recess, still see the sinus tympani. Again, the approach for the cochleostomy, external auditory canal, glenoid fossa, middle uh, cranial fossa, and now the reason why why I was harping on the internal carotid artery, the reason I was harping on the internal carotid artery, the entire horizontal internal carotid artery now visible, the petrous apex going up to the sphenoid, but you start seeing the basi occiput here, rest of the structures as before. We've moved down further, not very many important structures. Posterior canal has almost disappeared. We can still see the lower part of the vestibular aqueduct with the, uh, with the operculum. We can still see the mastoid segment, facial recess, sinus tympani, the basal turn of the cochlea. See, the apical turn has disappeared, the middle turn has disappeared, the, the basal turn persists. So the basal is the first to appear and the last to disappear. And now can you see this thin plate of bone over the lower part of the basal turn of the cochlea, which is the round window. This is the, the lip of the bone. The lip of bone that you see here is the round window niche. And this will be where you would have the secondary uh, membrane, that is the round window membrane, the handle of the malleus, the tensor tympani, eustachian tube, the entire internal artery, carotid artery now visible, the lateral sinus, and the beginning of the mandibular condyle in the glenoid fossa. I'm not sure about the contrast, but can you see an iso-intense shadow developing here? An iso-intense shadow developing here, that would be the shadow of the cochlear aqueduct, a bony channel that extends from the subarachnoid space to the basal turn of the cochlea in close proximity to the round window. Okay, now you can see the cochlear aqueduct much better. So this is the cochlear aqueduct. This is the cochlear aqueduct over here. It is going towards the basal turn of the cochlea. So this was the round window. This, was, this is now the entire basal turn of the cochlea. None of these other structures, with, I mean, none of the other turns of the cochlea are visible, correct? And this is the hump of the basal turn of the cochlea into the tympanic cavity, which is the promontory. We know the facial nerve is this. It's neither this nor is it this, it's this circular shadow. Now see what I had mentioned in the passing earlier, and that is how thin the anterior bone has become. Uh, the anterior bone wall of the external auditory canal wall has become because this is the tympanic bone. Now mind you, while doing a canal plasty, right? While doing it superiorly, you have a lesser chance, but inferiorly, you have a higher chance of causing a prolapse of the temporomandibular joint if you drill out this bone too much. And, and if you, in, in case you drill out too much of the posterior wall while doing a canal plasty, there is a chance of you to, of you creating a sinus into the from the external auditory canal into the mastoid antrum. None of the other parts of the vesti or the, of the labyrinth visible. You have the uh, internal carotid artery. And now can you see the basal part of the occiput or the clivus so, uh, or the clivus so petrous, sphenoid, and the occiput. So this is the area of the, sorry. This is the area of the clivus, right? So this is the area of the clivus. Uh, 
Dr. Mahajan, Dr. Shriharsh, how much time do I have? Sir, you can uh, continue up to uh, 5.45, sir. Okay, because it's just the coronal uh, action scan have a, still. Uh, another webinar scheduled at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, sir. Okay, so you want me to move faster or can we then take it on uh, after the coronals, take it on the next day? What do you want me to do? We can, sir. We can. If you yeah, sir. I think the speed is good, sir. Speed is okay. I hope I'm yeah. not going too slow. No, 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 sir. It's okay, sir. It's good, sir, actually. So everybody is uh, understanding, sir. Okay, okay. We can right. then the, I suppose we should not... The, sir, next day, sir, that is not a problem. See, sagittal sections take very little time, so we can always do it with the pathologies. I mean, I don't mind, but uh, uh, I suppose since the speed is fine, I'll continue with this speed, right? Perfectly fine, sir. You can continue. Okay, with yeah, yeah. So I'll just um, uh, take care of these annotations again, so... Sorry. Okay, so <clears throat> this is where we were. Now, again, now, now, now do you try, now try and uh, think of what I have been saying from the first section or right from the beginning of my presentation. Is it better to start, say, here? Or was it better starting here? I mean, I just want people to put in their opinion in the chat. Was it, is it better to start here? while reading the actual scans or is it better starting here? My personal opinion, this is definitely not the right place to start off, right? Because prior to this, I would, I mean, after this, I would come here. After this, I would come here. I would get confused about the facial nerve. This is my opinion. So in my opinion, superior to inferior matters. Anyway, uh, as I said, everyone can have their own uh, protocol worked out. Lower down, no part is, we can still see the basal part of the cochlea very faintly. Right, so the promontory basal part of the basal turn of the cochlea. This is the facial nerve. No mistakes anymore. This is the facial nerve mastoid segment. This is the eustachian tube with the tensor tympani. And we all know that the eustachian tube, in its lower part towards its floor and medial wall, has a has a close proximity to the internal carotid artery. So can we see that here? We can definitely see that here. So we see the close proximity of the internal carotid artery the eustachian tube and see how thin this bone is and this can actually be very very it can, can be dehiscent in a large number of cases so be very careful especially in dilation tissue i have seen surgeons blindly curating in this area to remove granulation tissue especially. See, polycytoma flakes come out very easily, but granulation is more difficult, what with the bleeding and otherwise. And I have seen people take a double-ended sharp curate and trying to curate the, the granulation here. Be very careful lest you get into trouble in case there is a dehiscent facial nerve, though there is a very tough, very adventitial venous plexus, as I had mentioned earlier, protecting you, but still, why risk? External auditory canal now becoming narrower. Why? Because we're reaching the floor of the external auditory canal. And this is the junction of the cartilaginous part with the bony part of the external auditory canal. Correct? Now, what we see anteriorly besides the glenoid fossa with the mandibular condyle is the wing of the greater, the greater wing of the sphenoid. And in the greater wing of the sphenoid, we have three important foramina, posterior to and or anterior to posterior, ROS. Rotundum. Ovale, sorry, and spinosum, sorry, spinosum, right? So most posterior is spinosum with the middle meningeal artery, anterior to that is foramen ovale with the, uh, with the, uh, 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 with the uh, mandibular division of the facial nerve. Uh, uh, and finally, more anterior is the foramen spinosum. Foramen spinosum is not visible on coronal section, uh, actual sections, and not very well visible even on coronal sections of uh, CT temporal. They're better visualized on the uh, paranasal sinus uh, scans. But this is the foramen ovale with the meningeal artery, and this is the for, uh, foramen spinosum, my, uh, my apologies. And this is foramen ovale with the, uh, tri with the mandibular division of the trigeminal. Nerve. So because we are at the greater wing of the sphenoid, as we move down, we will be entering into the intratemporal fossa. We still, we are not seeing the, uh, the, uh, the, the middle cranial fossa anymore because we are gradually coming out of the cranial cavity. But posteriorly, we are still seeing the posterior cranial fossa because simply for the simple reason that the middle cranial fossa is higher than the posterior cranial fossa. So the middle cranial is and ends earlier than the posterior cranial fossa, correct? Okay, right. So, 
So uh, this was about the uh, the uh, the uh, f uh, the two foramen that we see here. Moving on to the next one. Okay, so further down we have the facial here. We have the internal carotid artery here, and now the internal carotid artery from the horizontal to the gen is going to get converted into the vertical segment. And because the vertical perpendicular, we have it as a circular shadow. We have it as a circular shadow. So right now it's a kind of a dumbbell shadow. But it will become a circular shadow, eustachian tube, the genu of the internal carotid artery, the, the, the horizontal part of the internal carotid artery, the rest of the base of the skull. This is now the clivus, very well visible with the odontoid fossa, the, the foramen magnum here. But then all that is not a matter of discussion over here. In fact, you can see the synchondrosis here, over here. The synchondrosis between the sphenoid and the petrous apex and the occiput. Okay. So nothing much. Uh, here sir, to can I close and start again, sir? The yeah, dilution sure. problem is again happening, sir. Sure, 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 sure. Okay now? Is it okay now? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. It's okay, sir. It's fine, sir. Please continue, okay. sir. Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Now it's okay, sir. Yeah. So the external artery canal, now we are at the floor. But uh, now see beautifully, you see the foramen ovale the foramen spinosum. Actually, this is the area of the, uh, so, sorry, you see the foramen spinosum, foramen ovale. Uh, again, I'm so, uh, yeah. And this is the area of the foramen rotunda. But, and this now is the infratemporal fossa. So don't get restricted that I have ordered a CT temporal, so I'll just read what is here. You might find some, get some incidental finding anteriorly as well, right? So nothing much here to discuss. We'll skip this particular slide. We definitely know for sure that this is where our facial nerve is. See, we or as auto, auto surgeons, we are always bothered about the facial nerve, right? But because we've been reading these scans sequentially, we know that our facial nerve is safe and sound housed over here, right? Okay, so I'll just skip uh, these because there's not much to see here. What I definitely want to point out now is that the internal carotid artery has become a circular shadow because it's the vertical part. And also what you see is the lateral sinus moving anteriorly. Why? Because in the lower part of the uh, of the posterior fossa, the lateral sinus will become the sphygmoid sinus. And the sigmoid sinus, or rather the jugular bulb, and the jugular bulb has to come in close proximity to the internal carotid artery because they are both part I mean, par, uh, anti, I mean, in close proximity to each other, the internal carotid artery anterior and the jugular vein or the jugular bulb posterior, right? So they, the, the sigmoid, the lateral sinus has to move lat, uh, forwards and anteriorly uh, to form the jugular bulb. See? You see the sigmoid lateral sinus moving anteriorly and coming in close proximity to the internal carotid artery. So the, the jugular bulb. Okay, so that's this is the last segment, uh, the last part of the actual scan, and I'll move, quickly move on to the coronal sections. But before I move on to the coronal sections, I just want to show you one or two beautiful slices from the actual section, and that is number one is this, wherein you see the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve, you see the geniculate ganglion, you see the tympanic segment, and you even see the canal for the greater superficial petrocell nerve over here. Okay, so you the canal for the greater superficial petrocell nerve. Obviously, see you think you're seeing the basal turn of the cochlea here. You're seeing the vestibule. I, I won't waste time um, discussing the rest of the structures. But the reason I always show this particular scan is that if done properly, and if you know how to go about uh, analyzing these scans, you can actually identify, glean in a lot of information from PT scans. And this is the entire tympanic segment visible in one go. The entire tympanic segment on this is obviously the left side on one go and its close relationship to the cock. Also, this one is for the crotch, which was what I was talking earlier. See, this is the lateral sinus, and this is the jugular bulb, and this is the vertical part of the internal carotid artery with the jugular bulb, and this is crotch, the bone first to be eroded in cases of uh, glomus, known as Phelps sign radiologically. Phelps sign. Okay, so this is the crotch that uh, radiologists talk about. Students, postgrad students, get a get a get a question in their exams. That is the thin plate of bone which separates the jugular bulb posteriorly from the vertical part of the internal carotid artery anteriorly. Okay, 
Now we move on to the coronal sections and we shall be moving from posterior to anterior, from posterior to anterior, because we're moving from posterior to anterior and because this section is actually taken slightly obliquely in this manner. So what we see first is the limb or rather the entire trunk of the posterior semicircular canal, both with its upper end and its lower end. So if this is the upper end of the posterior semicircular canal, it's non-ampulated end. So this is where we should expect the cross commune later on. But this is the lower end of the posterior semicircular canal. So this is the ampulated end and you can actually see the limb in the, the trunk in between. And so this is the, the first structure that you saw on, ax, on uh, that you saw on actual scan was the superior. But the first that you see on coronal is the posterior moving posterior to anterior with the non-ampulated end or the cross commune end and the ampulated end. And in close proximity here is the mastoid segment, the vertical segment of the facial nerve. This is the area of the styloid mastoid, styloid mastoid foramen with the styloid bone covering the vagina styloidia as it is called. And you can actually see the beginning of the external uh, auditory canal. Now to come to an important part and that is the mastoid antrum with the periantral air cells and thin plate of bone that that covers the roof that forms the roof of the mastoid antrum. So this is the tegment and see you can actually appreciate the thin, the, the, the thickness or rather how thin the bone is on coronal scan than the actual scan. So this is tegment mastoidia. This is not the tegment mastoidia or tegment antri as you wish to call it. And as you move anterior, it will become the tegment tympani. Remember, look at the height. Keep the height of the tegment mastoidia in mind. Why? Because it's a wall. It's a the roof slopes forwards and anteriorly. So the tegment tympani is at a lower level than tegment antri. The tegment tympani is at a lower level than tegment antri or tegment mastoidia. So this is the tegment. So if this is the tegment, this has to be the middle cranial fossa. If this is the middle cranial fossa, this is the posterior cranial fossa. And this is the area of the jugular bulb because more posteriorly we have the jugular bulb. Also, there is a small mnemonic V for B, V for B, and C for C. When you see the vestibule, which we are seeing, or rather the labyrinth, we'll be also see the where we'll also start seeing the vestibule. When you see the vestibule, it's the jugular bulb. And when we start seeing the cochlea, it will be the carotid artery. So V for B and C for C. So we are seeing the jugular bulb. <clears throat> this is the basi occiput. This is the, uh, uh, the, ax, ax, uh, the ax, atlas, and you can actually see the odontoid process here of the axis. Anyway, as I, uh, I mean, that's not, again, the uh, area of discussion. Let's get, stay restricted here. But this is the middle cranial fossa, and this is the posterior cranial fossa. Okay, let me remove the annotations, otherwise it will cause a problem later on. Okay. So, <clears throat> now, we've come here. We've come here. A little more anteriorly probably because we've come here we do no not do not don't any longer see the body of the super posterior canal but we see only its upper and its lower end obviously this will be the area of the cross commune and this will be the ampulated end but what we definitely see an iso intense shadow extending laterally part of the labyrinth which is the lateral semicircular canal again while operating we come from here and the lateral canal is the first that we observe right the fact that this was the facial nerve Sorry, this was the facial nerve. Further gets clarified because we know that the mastered segment of the facial nerve will come in close proximity to the lateral semicircular canal, wherein it will get converted into the second genu and the tympanic segment. So this is the vertical segment of the facial nerve. You can see the master, the styloid process here gradually developing. You can actually see the external artery canal. You see the petrus apex, the apex of the petrus, and you see certain, they now, you can understand these air cells were visible on the actual scans also, but now that we know that these cells, or air cells are underneath the labyrinthine bone, we call it the infralabyrinthine and, uh, air cells, the petrus, the apical infralabyrinthine air cells, the middle fossa, posterior fossa with the tegment mastoidia or the tegment antri. Okay. Now, let's get a little more complicated get a little more complicated. Why are they complicated? Because we are getting more and more anterior, but we are not scared anymore. We are at the lateral semicircular canal, but we are at the posterior end of the lateral semicircular canal, which is the non-ampulated end. 
We are at the posterior end of the lateral semicircular canal, which is the non-ampulated end. And from here, where we had the upper part of the posterior canal, something moves upwards. So we are at the posterior part of the superior semicircular canal. So this now is the area of the crust commune, and this still is the opening of the posterior semicircular canal. So we can jolly well identify the crust commune here with the beginning of the superior semicircular canal. We still have the facial nerve somewhere here. It gets a little murky. Gets a little murky because from a vertical segment, the facial will become a horizontal segment. So from a longitudinal shadow, it will become a circular shadow right underneath the surface of the lateral semicircular canal. So our anatomy matches. Our anatomy matches external artery canal, outer cortex of the mastoid, the mastoid antrum, sorry, <clears throat> the periantral air cells, the periantral air cells, the mastoid antrum and the periantral air cells, the middle cranial fossa, the tegmen mastoidea, the posterior cranial fossa, still the jugular bulb. See how deep the retrolabyrinthine air cells are. God forbid if this patient has his cholesteatoma and the jugular bulb area. The jugular bulb area. Okay. Now. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier, and I was repeatedly making the mistake of using the word, the sleeping W sign. It's actually what I call the sleeping T sign. It's what you see in the more posterior part of the labyrinth. It's the sleeping T sign. The upper limb of the vertical part of the T is formed by the, this is the T. So this is the superior semicircular canal, the posterior limb. This is the beginning of the vestibule, and this is the lateral semicircular canal. So this is the sleeping T sign, the superior canal, the lateral canal, and the vestibule, right? Tegmen, but we now know that the facial nerve is here, right? We have been following the facial nerve, so we know the facial nerve is here. Why do we know that the facial nerve is here? Because we know that the facial nerve is always on the underneath of the, uh, uh, under surface of the bone over the lateral semicircular canal. External artery canal, tegmen, middle fossa, posterior fossa, jugular bulb you can see the vaginal process uh, the styloid process developing here the and with the vagina styloidia the thin plate of bone which covers the base of the styloid process anyway so this is the genu or the beginning of the vertical part of the facial nerve correct the genu or the vertical part of the facial nerve we have the beginning of the vestibule we have the lateral canal we still are at the but because we are moving a little more anterior we are somewhere here we are somewhere here. So we've totally lost out on the posterior semicircular canal. We have the vestibule. We have the lateral part of the semicir lateral semicircular canal now as a circular shadow. And we have the posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal. Okay. Okay. Now. <clears throat> What else happens when we move further anterior? When we move further anterior, the superior more or less disappears other than a circular shadow because we've come at the apex, at the dome of the superior. We've come at the dome of the lateral. So both of them are now visible as a circular shadow. Both of them are now visible as a circular shadow. We have the vestibule as a kind of a V-shaped shadow. If you look at it, V for vestibule. So the vestibule is actually exerting a V-shaped shadow, correct? lateral and superior but again within the uh, limbs of the superior we see an iso intense shadow a channel extending from the mastoid to the posterior face of the petrus and this is that same petromastoid canal with the subarcuate artery the same petromastoid canal with the subarcuate artery that we were visualizing on the coronal sections the mastoid antrum the periantral air cells we come here hit the lateral semicircular canal, the periantral air cells, the middle cranial fossa, the posterior cranial fossa, but at the petrus, posterior face of the petrus bone, now we start seeing the meatus of the internal auditory canal with its lips, but we do not see the anterior or the posterior lip, we see the superior or the inferior lip, right? So this is the meatus of the internal auditory canal, which we start visualizing. This is here where the facial nerve is. If this is the facial nerve, you can see the external artery canal. You see the thin bone thinning out. So technically, this is the area of the facial recess, but more importantly, this is the area of the sinus tympani, right? The part, the pocket of uh, the air pocket, sorry. 
the air pocket which is medial to the facial nerve deep to it and lateral to the vestibule this is the sinus tympani and these are some retro labyrinthine hypotympanic uh, infra labyrinthine rather air cells over here the stylet process and the rest of the structures okay lateral semicircular canal superior semicircular canal the vestibule the the tympanic segment of the facial nerve along with the sinus tympani and the external artery canal now completely canalized so if it is completely canalized this bone is the superior part of the deepest part of the external artery canal or rather the wall we are moving from the mastoid dentrum to the adductors to the attic and so this is the beginning of the scutum in fact very uh, you can see the faint shadow of the tympanic membrane over here so we moving towards the scutum the vestibule posterior middle posterior the internal artery canal the meatus with the internal artery canal the tegment mastoidea the mastoid antrum correct okay uh, do you want me to stop now and take in the questions or uh, do you want me to continue uh, sir you can continue another 5 minutes then in the end uh, we will okay. take up just some questions sir yeah. yeah yeah just let me know feel free please just let me know yeah yes yeah, okay so we move anterior we move anterior so we are somewhere here sorry we are somewhere here since we are somewhere here lateral and superior just circular shadows because both of them are perpendicular to our coronal section right both of them are perpendicular to our coronal section but now what do we see what do we see is that the vestibule or rather the part of the vestibule which communicates because now we we'll start seeing the cochlea see the jugular bulb is going out right i mean it's going out of the picture so the part of the vestibule which communicates with the cochlea is opening inferiorly correct so in the axial sections we saw the oval window first and the round window later on but on the coronal sections because we moving if you move posterior to anterior you see the round window first and the oval window later on correct and it is inferiorly on the axial sections it appeared posteriorly directed but on the coronal sections it is inferiorly directed so this is the round window niche now and that's the area where the round window membrane is and that's the reason why it's so difficult to visualize even on normal anatomy it's so difficult to visualize the round window membrane because of the round window niche so the first opening of the labyrinth in coronal sections posterior to anterior is the round window and not the oval window lateral canal just underneath the lateral canal the mastoid segment of the facial nerve and now can you appreciate the scutum better in fact you can actually see the thin shadow of the tympanic membrane from the superior to the inferior annulus right this is the mastoid antrum but it's narrowed out so this will be the area of the adductus correct superior annulus part of the annulus thinned out as the scutum external artery canal wall vestibule opening inferiorly internal artery canal with the meatus and the part of the canal the there is a supra labyrinthine air cell here as well and then this is the middle fossa the posterior fossa okay now this is interesting but we are quite confident that we'll be able to identify see I, what i said in the earlier section that the vestibule because the round window is actually the opening of the scala tympani so the vestibule is going to communicate with the co cochlea so the cochlea is visible now let me remove this and these annotations okay so this was the slice that we discussed earlier now we moved on to this slice which means that we are somewhere here sorry we are somewhere here i'm sorry somewhere here why because we are seeing the lateral canal in its entirety now but it's the anterior part of the lateral canal so it's the ampullated end of the lateral semicircular canal so this is the ampullated end of the lateral semicircular canal opening into the vestibule this is the superior still and this is what is called the arcuate eminence which we see on the roof of the petrous bone on the tegment on the roof of the petrous bone but mind you the arcuate eminence corresponds to the superior semicircular canal in only 45% of the cases in 55% of the cases you could have a bony hump on the roof of the petrous without having the superior semicircular canal underneath anyway so this is the arcuate eminence this is the facial nerve this is the scutum 
So this is the atitus attic area. And can you see this small shadow, circular shadow of bone here? So because we are posterior to inferior moving, posterior to inferior, the first ossicle that we'll visualize is part of the, of the ossicular chain that we'll visualize will be the short process of the ossicle, the short process of the incus. So this circular shadow is the short process of the incus. Correct? Facial nerve, vestibule, basal turn of the cochlea now beginning. So again, basal turn first to appear, last to disappear, irrespective of whether it's an axial or a coronal size. And what else do we see compared to the previous scan wherein the uh, labyrinth was opening in or rather the scala tympani was opening inferiorly, we find the labyrinth opening directly laterally. So this is the foot plate or the oval window area, which wherein we will see the stapes a little later, but this is part of the stapes. So facial nerve mastoid segment right underneath the <clears throat> uh, lateral semicircular canal and deep to it is the foot plate of the stapes. So this is the area of the sinus tympani. This is the scutum. This is the short process of the ingus. So this is the most posterior part of Cruzac's space. Middle fossa, tegmen, you can still keep continuing to calling it the tegmen antri, but now it will become the tegmen tympani the moment we reach the attic area. I'll just finish for today by discussing this part because I don't want to leave it midway. External auditory canal, this is the meatus, but now we see the fundus. Because now very quickly, we just go to that um, whiteboard. We, uh, we move from here in the coronal section, so we are somewhere here now. What is this? The superior vestibular nerve and what is this? The inferior vestibular nerve. So, so because we are there posteriorly, we see a small channel of bone from the inferior part towards the vestibule. So this is the channel for the inferior vestibular nerve. And we see a thicker channel from the upper part towards the rest of the vestibule. That's the superior vestibular nerve. And if you can imagine there is a, this triangular piece of bone over here, which is the transverse crest. So as I had mentioned, the vertical crest better visualized on axial and the transverse on the coronal scans, right? So this is the fundus and gradually it will thin out even more Th fundus and, and also very importantly, external auditory canal, vestibule, internal auditory canal. It's a three tiered structure from lateral to medial, it's a three-tiered structure in one single line. External artery canal, meatus, then the fundus and the internal artery canal. But the fundus is the thin plate of bone separating the vestibule laterally from the, the most lateral part of the internal artery canal. Do you want me to stop? You want me to continue? So, uh, I mean, is it the end of the coronal cut, sir? No, no, no. Uh, have quite a sir, bit. You still have 10 minutes to 5 minutes to go, sir, because uh, oh, five minutes we are going to, yes, sir, still 5 yeah, minutes okay. to go. Okay. So, you, you want to continue for 5 more minutes or you want to end it for here and we'll save the chat. So, when the next time, once you finish your complete presentation, we will present you the old questions as well as the new questions, sir. No, see, if I have 5 minutes, you tell me, you want me to answer some questions now or you want me to uh, continue with so a few more? You can continue the coronal cut, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure. If you, finish, okay, if you can finish off by 550. 5.45 is the time. You can take some five more minutes and still 5.50. Yeah, I won't be able to it. finish it, but I'll do a few more so that we have less to cover on the next day. Okay? okay. okay. Sure. Because coronal sure. sections, uh, it will get a little more complicated uh, as we go a little anterior. So there'll be, uh, we'll cover the rest of the coronal and the sagittal the next day. Not a problem. Okay. okay. Is that all right with you all? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is what we discussed uh, and now we come here. Okay, so let's start here. Lateral canal, we are at this part now. So what do we see? We see the superior coming down now. So this is the ampullated end of the superior. We also see the lateral joining the vestibule. So this is the anterior end of the vestibule of the lateral and both are the ampullated ends of the the respective semicircular canal. So the vestibule getting the opening, anterior opening of both the lateral and the superior. So this is the ampullated end of the lateral and the superior semicircular canal. What do we see? We see the vestibule opening laterally 
and we see the foot plate and we can see the head of the stapes. Mind you, the stapes, the entire superstructure of the stapes is always better visualized on an axial section. We see the basal turn of the cochlea. As I said, first to appear, last to disappear. First to appear, last to disappear. And we'll start seeing the internal carotid artery, like I mentioned, V4B and C4C. So this is the foot plate of stapes with the head of the stapes. And now the attic or the aditus better visible with the short process of the incus, the scutum and the aditus add antrum along with the upper part of the attic. Okay, this is the rest of the, uh, the this is the external auditory canal, middle cranial fossa, tegmen, the internal auditory canal. But before I go to the internal auditory canal, look at this structure inferiorly. This is the cochlear aqueduct. This is the cochlear aqueduct, lies between the jugular bulb and the internal carotid artery in between, connecting the subarcuate space with the uh, <clears throat> Uh, with the basal turn of the cochlea. This is part of the uh, cochlear aqueduct, uh, but we'll discuss that later on. What is more important to cover here is how thin the bone over the fundus has become. How thin the bone over the fundus has become. But now that we've moved a little more anteriorly, can you see this canal going downwards towards the basal turn of cochlea? In the previous one, it was a canal which was going towards the vestibule, but now we see the canal going downwards towards the basal turn of the cochlea and it's much wider compared to this canal because this the cochlear nerve is multiple foramina and so this is the canal for the cochlear nerve so this happens this projection happens to be the transverse crest at the fundus so this is the last part of the superior of the uh, superior vestibular nerve and probably the beginning of the facial nerve very difficult to differentiate on ct but uh, we will definitely visualize the facial nerve later on middle cranial fossa tegmen up to you you want to call it the tegmen mastoidea or the tegmen antri but already see where the tegmen was earlier see the height of the tegmen earlier now see where the tegmen has come because it's a forward downward sloping a piece of a roof of bone this is a retro labyrinthine air cell petrus apex middle fossa posterior fossa okay now now what do we see we see still see the anterior part of the lateral and the superior so ampulated end ampulated end of both the lateral and the superior semicircular canal we see the vestibule opening laterally this is the foot plate now besides the incus short process we start seeing the body of the incus extending downwards as a long process turning at right angles as the lenticular process and articulating with the stapes besides that we still these master we see the tympanic segment of the facial nerve sorry I forgot to point out the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, which was here very close to the head of the stapes, the tympanic segment of the facial nerve here. Now we were discussing this segment. So right on the underneath of, uh, of the lateral semicircular canal, we see the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. And I'll just zoom in here. I'll not be able to annotate, but I'll just zoom in here because there's an important feature that you need to know here. And what you need to see here is when you see the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, can you see a trough here? So on the bone underneath the tympanic segment of the, I mean, underneath the lateral semicircular canal, where you have the tympanic segment of the bone of the facial nerve, you see a small depression here. There is a trough of bone. It's the canal in which the facial nerve is housed. Now, where, what is surprising is what has been mentioned in literature is that if there is dehiscence of the facial nerve, the facial nerve comes out. The bone the, over the facial nerve over here is dehiscent. The facial nerve comes out and somehow this depression is lost. Whether there is new bone formation, what is the reason? I tried finding, but I could not. But they, it has been claimed in literature that if you zoom into this particular slice, you can actually see this crest, this trough of bone, this depression here. And if the facial nerve is dehiscent, this becomes a straight line. It becomes a straight line. See, so this crest actually becomes a straight line when the facial nerve is dehiscent and comes out. So this is the oval window, basal turn of the cochlea, right? I'll, I won't go here, but I'll quickly cover off this meatus, internal auditory canal, and you can see the transverse crest. You can see the transverse crest. I can still call it probably the, uh, the most posterior part of the superior vestibular nerve, or maybe the beginning of the facial nerve and the cochlear nerve here. See the cochlear. And, 
in the field. Yeah. So this is the most posterior part, most uh, uh, anterior, uh, anterior part of the superior vestibular nerve rather, and the most posterior part of the facial nerve, because as we come anterior from the superior vestibular nerve, we'll be moving to the facial nerve. Okay. The tegmen, the posterior middle fossa and the posterior fossa. Okay. We move one step ahead. We move one step ahead. What do we see? That this shadow has become an oblong shadow. This shadow has become an oblong shadow. And please remember this when we discuss the rest of the coronal sections next day. And that is the axis of this oblong shadow. Okay. The axis of this oblong shadow. We see an oblong shadow which is oriented obliquely. So we are in the attic, posterior part of the attic. This is the body of the incus. But this is not the long process. This is the part of the malleus handle, which is already visible. Part of the malleus handle, probably because the malleus handle is not only lateralized, it is slightly posteriorly pulled as well. So this is the body of the incus. This is the attic area, scutum, area of the Prusak space, though the Prusak space is more in relationship to the neck of the malleus rather than the body of the incus. And now can you see the vertical uh, transverse crest? This is the transverse crest and this is the facial nerve now for sure because this is the cochlear nerve now. This is the facial nerve and so this was the intracanalicular part of the facial nerve and this is the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve. This is the tympanic segment. Why? Because these two segments have to come in close proximity and fuse together to form the geniculate ganglion. They have to come in close proximity and fuse together to form the geniculate ganglion. You can still see the faint shadow of the superior semicircular canal. You can still see the faint shadow of the superior semicircular canal. But now can you appreciate the vertical part of the internal carotid artery in the lower part of the petrous bone? So posterior to anterior, the vertical part of the carotid would be better visible. Okay, the vertical part of the carotid. So C for C, V for B. C for C, V for V. And this is the part of the cochlea foramen for the cochlear nerve. This is the basal turn. So friends, this becomes the modulus. This becomes the modulus. And I'll show you the interscalar septum better in the subsequent scans. But you can start assuming that this is where the interscalar septum would be. And this is the modulus or the long axis of the cochlea tegmen. Okay. <clears throat> Sir, uh, it's already 5.50, sir. Sure, so, sure. So we want to end the session now. We are saving yeah. all the questions for now, sir. Sure, so sure, sure. Next time uh, when you're on Wednesday, we are going yeah. to finish off your talk and then we are going to pose all the questions and everything. Absolutely. I hope the participants have enjoyed it as much yes, as uh, Manoj Agrawal, sir, it is very nice presentation, very compactly presented. I am sure now each and everyone will be thorough with the, all the structures now. And in also chat box, I can see more than uh, uh, questions. There are many congratulations messages for you because nobody has taught uh, CT temporal bone like you to anyone before. Thank so, you so it was much. Very informative lecture, sir. Definitely the remaining part we will like to have in the next lecture first before you go ahead with the another lecture of yours. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We can always, uh, I mean, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but in case we are not able to finish it the way we want to, I mean, as per the schedule, we can always have a fourth session because I always believe that it's good to do things thoroughly rather than just rush through it. Yeah, sir. Uh, to, just for the sake of finishing it, you know, I can, I, I don't mind uh, postponing the MRI uh, talk maybe by a day and having, uh, in case we have to, I mean, obviously the rest all depends upon you. I mean, whether you like my face or not. We will definitely try to finish up. If not, we will extend one more, sir. Sure, but definitely. To do it, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Have a lovely, lovely evening, all of you. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. And uh, you, sir. Dr. Sheharsh, I have a small request. If you can just send me this chat, you know, it always pleases me to see friends and especially youngsters, you know, um, if they like it and if they appreciate it. If you can just send me a copy of the chat, yes. you know. Yes, it's, it's, it's always very heartening to see because I can't see all the messages right now. And the moment I move out of Zoom, I lose the chat. Okay, sir. So we have saved it, sir. We will send it to you, sir. Definitely. Please do. Please do. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And I'll see you again on Wednesday. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.